det, 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 det project now goes back four years. About we, we were at the the Berkeley the the, 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 the Gump station to, 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 to talking about the conference center there. They are and, and talking about the reason to the science on an island, and then I got the, 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 Neil Davis came up with the idea that one could actually make a model not just for the, the, the bits and pieces of a place, but for the whole place, for, for a, and I got the, the, the whole island to start with, and then going from there to a continent and the Earth. Kind of, can we simulate an ecosystem and can we predict it? And I started to work with Neil and Sally and Russ and George and Jim and many others who are here now. And we built up a preview of what we envision. And now since now, uh, now this year I moved to, to Microsoft to change my job from academia to a company, but we can still do to, 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 to research and this vision of the uh, the, 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 the idea the how we to, to, to call it is relevant also. So for Microsoft. We had planned today to have a meeting here with the the group who who worked on the project check the end with people from Microsoft due to us and yes suddenly announced Reorg the second part will not happen this time but we use this as a way to present the project here. There may be people who follow the talk by video, and the talk will be recorded if you agree, and then we'll do the broader meeting with more people in the fall sometime. So when you, you talk here, you talk not only to people in the, the, the audience who know what it's about, but also to the, the, the others here who are, the, who are not experts, and it will be later, later be available on the, the, the internet. So this can be, be a way to, 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 to showcase the, 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 the project globally. Now I want to welcome you to Microsoft, to Redmond here. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad so many came from nearby, like from Kirkland, or from the west side, which is much farther, or from California, from the east coast, and from French Polynesia. Welcome all, and let's start with the first talk by Neil Davis from the, the, the UC Berkeley Gump Station. Okay, thanks Matthias. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and thanks to Microsoft for hosting us. So I'm going to start off with a, a quick sort of introduction. Um, first of all, a few words about where I come from, uh, where I'm working. Uh, so I'm the executive director of the University of California's Gump Station on Morea, and also a senior fellow at the BIDS, uh, Berkeley Institute for Data Science. So just uh, a few pictures of, of where I work. So the Gump Station is a marine laboratory and a, and a field station, uh, originally uh, on land donated by Richard Gump to the University of California in the early 1980s, about 33 uh, acres of land on, on the waterfront. And basically most of our buildings, pretty much all of them, uh, have been built thanks to investments from the Gordon and Betty uh, Moore Foundation and the, and the Moore family. So one of the kind of interesting and, and somewhat unique things about uh, 
where we're located is not only do we have a University of California facility on this island, but the other side of the mountain there, you can see uh, we have a French research uh, center that's been there longer since the early 1970s, uh, the CREOB, which is also France's uh, center of excellence for coral reef research, coordinates uh, all of uh, France's coral reef research. So there are two institutions based here, large focus on coral reefs, but also on the, on the whole island system, because the coral reefs depend on everything that's happening on land too, of course. Um, and so we have this partnership, which we call the, the Morea Eco Station, and we're located in the heart of the Pacific Ocean in French Polynesia, an overseas country of, of France. Uh, just another mention of uh, another facility we have access to uh, is operated by Tetiroa Society, which wearing another hat, I'm the uh, uh, science director for Tetiroa Society. And uh, that little atoll up there in the north there is Tetiroa. And thanks to a partnership with the Pacific Beachcomber a company in Tahiti. Uh, we have this uh, small lab on this uh, atoll, which is uh, managed by Tetra Society, California registered uh, 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, and that's in partnership with a resort on that atoll, the, the Brando, which is a really exceptional uh, luxury, but very eco resort, almost zero net carbon, as you can see, uh, winning various challenges here. Uh, and I'll, we'll talk a lot more about that, uh, the atoll and the operations there later on this morning. Okay, so the Morea idea, as it, as it started, as Matthias said uh, a few years ago, uh, can we build a simulation of this entire social ecological system? So I'll just get, run through some of the thinking behind this. Uh, in, in some ways, this is possible today and maybe motivated today by something that Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum is called the Fourth Industrial Revolution, the fusion of the physical, digital, and biological world. Basically, when you combine Moore's law and the internet, everything today has an avatar and is connected. And so when I say everything, we mean um, the digital integration of the physical, social, and biological worlds, meaning all things. Uh, a, di a bit digital or have digital avatars and co are connected. Um, people are, of course, increasingly connected, and some of the, the new technologies down there on this graph, things like blockchain and, uh, of course, quantum computing is in there as well. There's quite a lot of expertise on this campus where we're standing today. So this is a, a very major change, um, but also all biology. Uh, species, we're increasingly digitizing life and not only reading the code of life, but also synthesizing that code, writing the code, and synthesizing organs and, and even organisms. So everything is, is connected, and that's, uh, this, this revolution is enabling another big trend in globalization, um, enabling it and feed it, feeding back on it. And globalization is sort of leading to a, a planet-down approach, if you like. But we can see the entire Earth now Humans are shaping it. We are geoengineers, accidental geoengineers, and we need to become more deliberate geoengineers if we want to end up at a, at a healthy outcome for us and for every, every other organism and species that lives on this planet. <clears throat> so as we started exploring uh, outer space and the, the missions to the moon, the most important, if probably, uh, result of, of going to the moon was when we turned around and looked back at the Earth and saw it as this island in space, a, uh, a connected, integrated system. Um, and this NASA calls this an overview effect. You really feel it viscerally when you can see the whole system. Uh, this is the view here focused on, on Europe. But if we spin it around and focus it on French Polynesia, we also get a very important uh, uh, impression here that this is, you know, the planet should have been called ocean, not Earth, but uh, the ocean is 70% of, of our planet, and it's inconceivable that any future, sustainable future for humanity on this planet will not involve the ocean in a big way. So that's, that's going to be a, a subtext to a lot of what we talk about as well uh, during the next day or two. So there's Morea and French Polynesia, really in the heart of the blue planet. And of course, uh, what this globalization and all these technologies mean is that we have to study the, the Earth as a, as, a, as a whole. 
Uh, there are very large scale processes which needs a lot of big science in ecology. Finally, we have big science. Uh, you can see where Morea is there, and clearly you couldn't understand Morea without looking at the, the system in which it's very obviously embedded, the Pacific Ocean, in this case El Nino, and the changing uh, temperature gradients we'll hear, hear much more about. Clearly he's just studying one little place in, in the midst of that vast ocean. Could change tomorrow and you wouldn't know why if you weren't looking about what's around it. So this is really incredibly important and a big breakthrough over the last uh, couple of decades. But <laughs> globalization is, is all very well, but there's a reason we say in politics everything is local. Because we really care about what happens to us at our human scale. And human scale isn't the planet. The human scale is you know, us in this room. We are, we are a slow species, uh, quite a large species, uh, relative to, to most, most of biodiversity. You know, so we work at our scale. And as the great acceleration happens, we struggle with our human scale brains and bodies to keep up with this massive acceleration in technology. We can't. We need gears to slow it down for us so we can understand it and, and incorporate it into our institutions, which are very slow evolving. <clears throat> so we need to look at the local scale. We need this process of localization to balance globalization. <clears throat> and this takes a different approach from looking at the planet down. We need to look also from in life from the genome and the cell up. So the, the, a major scientific challenge in the, what kind of work we're doing is how do we connect these large-scale changes to local-scale processes, impacts, and also in aggregate local-scale feeds back to the, to the global. So for, this is really the science of sustainability, which is a, a new science, the ultimate in, in interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary science, if you like. And we really have to work at, at the scale of the planet. So for example, looking at how the oceans are absorbing carbon and becoming acidified, which we'll hear more about later. But if we want to understand, say, the impact of ocean acidification, we also have to look at genomes, go into the corals and look at the zooxanthellae, the microbes, and how they interact with the coral genome, and how the process of uh, calcification takes place, how it might be influenced under different pHs. And there's lots of variation among individuals and among species that needs to be considered. So you, you absolutely have to work at that scale, too. <clears throat> so again, we need science from genome up and planet down. So if we're going to understand that at the, at the local scale, we need places that are incredibly well studied and uh, in a lot of detail. And there are a few of those around the world. Um, many of them are what's known as long-term ecological research sites where we really focus in on a, on a place and understand as much as we can about it. For example, what are all the species that live there? That seems like a very simple question. It is a parts list, but there's <laughs> very, very, very few places that have anything close to a complete response to that. Uh, Morea is one, thanks to the Moore Foundation, we had a $5 million uh, project to uh, basically inventory all the animals and plants, including genetic sequences, tags of all of them, and digital images. <clears throat> so that's a great start, but really we should notice that that's just the animals and plants. So the microbes, there's a long, long way to go. We've made a big, big start on this area in Morea as well, but, but microbial, the microbiome of an, even of a small island is, is a vast challenge to, to get a handle on what, what species are there and what they're doing. <clears throat> so more generally, this, this project of understanding a place from genome up and all of the interactions that happen within that system uh, is a major integration challenge. We have to integrate across different sciences, environment, ecology, the history of the islands, the physical, biological, and social history, how they got to be where they are today. We've got new genomic observatory techniques we can look at. Uh, and of course, what are humans doing, the socioeconomic uh, uh, patterns uh, that we see within the society there. So all of these are, are major fields in their own right, but if we're going to understand the whole system, we have to integrate across them. So that challenge is, is really the same one we're, we're facing in understanding the planet, and there are organizations that are working on a global scale to develop the standards and approaches that are necessary, particularly in the data integration realm, to, to make this science possible. Uh, so at the global level, we have Group on Earth Observatories, coordinates among, among countries across lots of different societal domains and, and data areas, uh, including biodiversity. And within biodiversity, we have uh, genomics and genomic standards consortium working on how to spread common standards so we can compare uh, studies we're doing of microbes and other genomic 
uh, investigations. So on Morea, we're kind of taking this as a, Morea in some ways is a very powerful uh, case study where all of this is happening. Uh, and what we want to do is, is really advance that more. So we're trying to build this avatar, a digital representation of, of the planet, which is an overwhelmingly complex problem. Uh, we faced overwhelming complexity in science before, for example, in medicine, in trying to, to understand the human body, which is probably one of the most complex things in the universe, if not the most complex. Uh, and we've done that by studying a small number of model species, simpler organisms, uh, like C. elegans, or yeast, or, uh, or the fruit fly. And that's been very powerful. Uh, so these are model systems approaches. So we're arguing in this project that we need the same thing for ecology and sustainability more generally. We need model systems, simpler model systems, simpler than the entire planet. Uh, and if you look for a model system that incorporates human society and its relationship with the environment, small, relatively isolated islands, are, it's hard to come up with better model systems. Then, of course, you can go which islands, but some of the ones that are most studied already are, are a good place to start. So that's, that's the basis of our approach. And Gauguin really phrased what we're trying to answer here very well, influenced himself, of course, by French Polynesia. Uh, where do we come from? What are we today? And, and maybe most importantly, where are we going? And we probably need to answer the first two questions to answer the third. So our approach is uh, we take the planet, which is overwhelmingly complex. Uh, it used to look like that on the left, natural planet. Now it's increasingly looking uh, like a human uh, construct. And find simple island systems, or small island systems, I should say, uh, as microcosms to understand that across that, that spectrum from natural to human dominated. So some work with various collaborators, including uh, some of the people here are involved with, uh, are looking at some city, city islands like Manhattan or Singapore and, and modeling cities. Of course, that's also happening cities on, on continental areas including Seattle. <clears throat> We're more focusing more at the natural end because Morea and French Polynesia is still uh, relatively undeveloped. And, and our mission really is to build use-oriented simulations, avatars of entire social ecological systems. And uh, you can see the obvious challenges there, uh, as I've mentioned. So we started first kickoff meeting in November 2013 in Zurich. We've had a number of, of uh, meetings to try and push this forward uh, since then. Uh, obviously leading up to this one, and making some progress. I should say those meetings not only include different groups of scientists across different domains and have had different themes, they also very crucially involve the local community, in our case, the Tahitian community, because solving this problem is, is really one that will draw on traditional knowledge, local knowledge, wherever that might be, uh, and as well as uh, sort of global scientific uh, understanding and the combination of those two. This is a sort of participatory approach that, uh, that parallels the so-called P4 approach to human health in medicine. Uh, we, we really want to build a, a system that is personalized. Every place is different, just like every person is different. Uh, predictive, you know, what will happen to the health of you, that person, under different scenarios. Preventative, so then we can make those predictions and avoid some negative outcomes, which is much cheaper. Uh, and more effective than, than treating the illness. So how do we maintain wellness? And participatory, meaning you have to get involved in your own personal health, but also if we want to sustain the places we live, we have to get involved in helping to, to manage those places too. <clears throat> so, so, so there's been uh, kind of outlines of this uh, published, uh, a large and expanding uh, group of institutions involved, as well as individual uh, investigators. Uh, these institutions aren't formally signed up. These are really representing places where we've got nodes of uh, clusters of people who are interested in working on the project. And a sort of roadmap uh, also has been published. And now we're in the process of kind of implementing that roadmap, and that's hopefully what we'll make some progress on later today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Neil. Say questions to the end, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do that. Oh, Matthias. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so while I'm speaking, I think probably Sally should get up and chair the session <laughs> for me. 
Yeah. No, so uh, the, 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 what, the, one may wonder what does uh, computational physicists like me do in the ecology. And, uh, and uh, the, the reason is, is like, simply that knowing, uh, knowing like, uh, computational tools and physics tools is great to apply them to a broad area and to, 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 to new challenges. And so we then try to start and build up the model for the place. Because if you want to really model all of the actions between the, 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 the species accurately and predict the future of a system, you have to know the physics, the chemistry of it, the water flows and the, 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 the topography. And so we want to build up this, 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 nigger, this nigger, the, the avatar. That's what I did when it was still at the ETH, and that's why there's the ETH logo up there and not the Microsoft one yet. So we want to build up a 4D model of the place, a space-time model, 3D space, 1D time, how it changes in time. We want to have like, a special access to the data in the place. We want to get the data that exists. We want to use it as a platform to, to, to simulate the future, and we want to use it as a platform to visualize the results and the data. So how do we build such a model? And this here is a snapshot actually of the model and not of the island. You first need to get a picture from it, and we do that, Let, let's see. Yeah. Need, that has to, so, yeah. That's, that's messed up. Yeah. Oops. I'm sorry for that. Okay, so we need to build a the, the, the model and for that I got got like a help help from my like retired Professor of Photogrammetry, Armin Grün, and he, 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 he helped us here build a model. In the past, you had to really go around and you have to, to sound depth manually, you had to, to survey things manually, and it took a long time. time nowadays, we can use use airplanes, we can use satellites, we can use boats and so on, and we can really, really you know, to, 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 to automate the to, to data taking, and things go much faster. So we start with the island, we start for the land part with, with you know, satellite you know, you know, images, we task the, the, the the player satellite. We had to wait for a month and till, till like, yeah, most clouds were gone and got the, 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 the picture of, of like, the, the Moria and one of the Tiroa. We didn't get just one, we got three pictures during the flyover. One, two, and three, and then from, from those three, one picks a stereo pair and can make a 3D model of it. But first, one has to work on the pictures because one has a beautiful, sharp picture with the, the resolution of here less than a meter, but only in black and white, and that's. That's the picture of the French research station clear up there. Then we also have a picture in color, but that is much coarser. And now one can merge them to get one <laughs> pen sharp and color image. 
With that, now we need to know where on space is that. So we've been uh, needed yeah, the help from local people who, who, uh, who measured yeah, certain features just, yeah, just, just yeah, precisely using yeah, the, the GPS. And then that way we could build up the land model. Now the satellite does not look deep down into the water. So the great news there is there was a cruise planned by, by Jim Hench, who is here, to do a sonar mapping of the regions around the, 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 the islands. Then with a big boat for the, 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 the bigger area and with a the, the small boat for the, 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 near, the near shore one. But that is still a challenge for the parts where it's very flat. And there, one then did the LIDAR mapping with, with lasers from an airplane, which mapped out the, the, the lagoon area of Morea. And we plan to do the same now this, in the coming month for the Teteroa. And that goes down to the lagoon. But it gives you only the big scales. You can also zoom in and look at the small scales, like at the reef itself, the coral. And there you can basically do the same thing. You go there, you take a satellite and a camera, and you fly over. OK, in this case, it's a diver, like me and the colleague. You just, just fly or, or swim or, or over the reef and you do the, 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 the same thing. I think you take pictures and then you build up a model from that. And that way you get the physical model of the place. And then there are many groups working there. French groups, local groups, US groups, and many others. And they all have the interesting data. And but to find it is hard. You have to look at many sources, many web pages, like of the Gump Station, some projects like the Biocode. Code you have the database. Same does the Morea Coral Reef Reef LTER. When you go to the French page, they give you a link to somebody that you can, can send a mail to to ask for data they have. And some data is just in books, and you have to talk to people and find it. You can find it, we know that, but it would just be great to have this model. We can just go there and find the data that exists for now, and then in the future where you can then predict things through simulations. And this model should be a way to integrate the data and show, 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 show the unified view. It should not be a place that grabs all your data and stores it locally away from you, but it's a way to give access to the data that people have, a way to find it better. And, uh, like an index. And so I want to show you the vision we have there. We have had the uh, software engineer, the, 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 the ETH, who could, could make a the, the demo, a preview, we call it, of what this, this, this might look like. And we hope that we can build something big and bad in the future, and that's why we meet here now to, to discuss the next steps. But let me show you the model review. That's on our web page. Where you read about the project itself, but there's also a link to launch the preview of the avatar. And it comes up 
as if you're sitting above the island of Morea. Now, uh, the first thing you can do is you can just zoom in and fly around like if that were a video game. You just use some game engine to fly around here. You can, for example, fly over to the gum station that Neil mentioned before. And it has to load a bit of the data, but you can fly around the island here. Fly up to Neil's house. <laughs> But yeah, he's not there. You can fly down and fly out to the ocean. And in the distance here, you see the island of the Tiroa. The water is gone here. We did not model the water yet. So you see beautifully far out, there's this, uh, this volcano up and then just the flat top of the atoll. And we can actually fly over there, or we can take a shortcut. Because we, can, we also have a model over there. We can also just jump over here and look at Teteroa. We can also fly around here and fly towards this Brando Resort or to the airstrip down here. And look at it. Now, the one thing is flying around, but more interesting is what exists here in data. So let's go back to Morea. Let's look at the whole island from above. And we can, we have data sources here lifted on the left, like there's a mapping of the, the, uh, the, 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 the shallow corals by the, 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 the Creop group. And you can go there and you, you look at the habitats what is sand, what is coral, what is algae, and so on, and fly away it. You can also add the, 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 the similar map for the, 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 the vegetation, or you go to the, 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 the data that one has from the Moria Coral Reef LTER. Let's just just look at some of that. We can show, and let's maybe hide our shallow coral. Let's show the data point from the LTR. You know, zoom out here. We see uh, regions where they have data. For example, here. Click on. Uh, one of the points, and it shows me uh, who are now as uh, the collection of the data sources, since there are, with links to the web page where I find the data. Now, in the future, what I would love to have here, and what the vision is, that I can just go here. And I look at the data and I can't just make grab the data. I want to be able to plot it. I want to be able to look at it, correlate it, analyze it. So I don't just want to have a link here that takes me to a web page that I can link, click through and somewhere and fill in forms and then get the data. But I want to be able to just access it once I have an account there. And that's what we want to, 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 to build up now. That's, that's why. We, why we are, are here, we want to find kind of what tools are there that make it easy for us, because we don't want to build it all from scratch. It can be done as a show, but then to maintain it, expand it is hard. It's much better if we find tools that exist that, that help us with that. And that's what we want to plan here and discuss. So, with that, 
you all can look at the model online. You go to the web page. The simplest link is moreaidea.org. It works in the Edge browser of Microsoft. It works in Google Chrome. It does not work well on Safari. So don't use Safari for it. But we made sure it works on a surface. Hub touch screen. You go there, zoom in, tilt it, turn around, and look at the place and the data. Thank you. Now, let, let's, let's get up to, 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 to move on to the to, to, to third talk by Iseli. I have a quick question. Yeah. How is the coral mapped? Okay, how is the coral mapped in there? That's a good question. What the, sense, this is done by remote sensing. They looked at the picture like this from the satellite and they did machine learning on the patterns and color yeah. by having thousands of ground control points where they, they knew what's there. They did it both for depth and for the, 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 the coral. The depth works Kind of, it scatters a lot. We can show, I might have a, a slide for that. Let's see if I have one or not. No. So the depth scatters a lot. No, I don't have one. So th that's why for that depth we go to LIDAR, but the the, 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 the mapping of the, the coil seems to work. What we started doing last year is doing like a, the, the flyovers with drones at the height of you know, 15 meters, and that works much better. Then you see every single coil head, you see what is seaweed, what is coral, and there you, we can then, the, then look at change. That's work in progress, kind of how things change. So it works very well with drones but it also seems to work with satellites at the core scale. Santa Barbara, that takes a while to come up because it's a Mac. And yeah, welcome. Okay. Uh -huh. okay, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what we know so far about the biology of the reefs on Morea with uh, particular respect to disturbances and recovery processes on the reefs. So we know that coral reefs have always been disturbed by a lot of different natural sources. And you probably have heard about cyclones, um, which can create storm waves. There's coral bleaching. And uh, of course, it, uh, Neil showed a slide from a year ago about the big bleaching event that occurred, uh, in the, especially in the Indo-Pacific. So we have uh, regular coral bleaching events that happen. And in addition, we have in the Indo-Pacific outbreaks of a predator on coral, crownothorn sea stars, which are a, a, a sea star whose populations undergo huge boom and bust cycles. And when they really get going, they can actually completely consume the live coral on a reef. So until recently, that is the past few decades, Coral reefs appeared to be able to recover from these different natural disturbances that happened. And ecologically, we refer to that as being resilient. And of course, ecologists right now are super interested in the issue of resilience of not only coral reefs, but other natural systems that, get, that undergo disturbances and then either do or don't recover. 
Now, in the past couple decades especially, people have increasingly observed coral reefs that get disturbed, they lose most or all of their cover of live coral, and then coral does not grow back on that reef. And some of these reefs, especially you may have heard about in the Caribbean, for, for example, transition to a cover of seaweeds instead of returning to their original cover of live coral. Now, coral reefs are under increasing stress from local changes as well as global changes. And both of these appear to lower resilience and can result in reefs after disturbance transitioning into algae-dominated reefs or reefs that, that don't, aren't dominated by macroalgae but actually just lack coral. And of course, whatever state you think a reef should be in, uh, often the consensus is, is that the coral-dominated state is the preferred natural state for, for a tropical reef. Now, um, things like fishing pressure and nutrient pollution are very local kinds of stresses. And it's now becoming increasingly appreciated that if we reduce local stresses, like overfishing and uh, nutrient and other kinds of pollutant inputs to, to local reefs, that can help maintain reef resilience in the face of global stresses like global warming, ocean acidification, and then these natural disturbances, some of which are, are related to those global factors like cyclones, crown of thorns, uh, predator outbreaks, or cor coral bleaching. But clearly, we need a much better understanding of socio-ecological systems to understand how we can maintain resilience of reefs and in so doing, maintain the ecosystem services that coral reefs provide us. Now, Neil uh, touched on some of this uh, in his comments this morning, but Morea is really an ideal study system to begin to study resilience because it's among the best studied tropical islands in the world. We have a ton of data, some of which Mateus has mentioned already, um, both from the physical environment, the, the, both on land and in the ocean, the biological uh, features of the island, and the social economic uh, aspects of the island. And our studies that we've been doing on Morea in the last 15 years or so have shown us that the reefs around Morea vary from reefs that are very high in ecological resilience, that is, they recover really well from disturbances, to reefs that are pretty low in resilience. And I'll tell you more in, about that in a second. And as Neil mentioned, there's just about the right amount of complexity in the social ecological system on Morea that makes it a really good study system to try to link all the different processes that uh, form the island ecosystem as a whole. Now, I, I just want to tell you a little bit about what we know so far about resilience um, on Morea. And one of the major things that we have found is that the fore reef of Morea is more resilient than the lagoon reefs. And the fore reef is the part of the reef system of, of Morea that's outside the barrier reef of the island. So if you see the waves breaking on the reef crest on this slide, the fore reef is the steeply sloping reef that extends offshore of that. And of course, the lagoon is the reef section of the island that's enclosed by the fore reef. Okay, And obviously, you can see that the lagoon is much closer to shore and to human influences, as I'll tell you about in a minute. Now, I'll just show you a tiny piece of data that we've got um, about the fore reef to illustrate what we mean when we say high resilience. Um, and here I'll show you uh, just a little piece of, uh, of data on the bottom right, which is the percent cover of live coral at just one place on the fore reef indicated by that arrow up there on the north shore of the island. And you can see this time series begins in 2005. Um, and coral cover at that time was very high. Um, when we estimate cover of live coral, if the cover is 40, 50% or so, that's really considered maximal 
um, cover in the Indo-Pacific. And you could see a picture of what that looked like at about 10 meters depth in 2006. Okay, so a lot of coral there, um, really chock-a-block full um, at that site in, in, at that time. Okay, so then, starting in 2007 at that site, going for a couple years, there was a big outbreak of the crown of thorns sea star, and you can see these guys here. They've eaten the live coral off of the right hand part of the picture, and you can see the dead coral skeleton. They've scraped all the live tissue off, and they're headed this way to consume um, the live coral that's on that's brown, that's on the left hand uh, part of that that photo. And then in addition, in early 2010, a cyclone hit Morea, especially the North Shore, pretty hard. So by uh, spring of 2010, at that site that had 50% live coral cover in 2006, four years later, we measured the coral cover being about 2%. So basically, there's, there's virtually no live coral in that photo uh, that you see there at the 10 meter depth in 2010. Now, what happened? Well, uh, by 2014, coral cover at that site had uh, regained a lot of cover, about 30% cover, and by 2015, it was at 55% cover. So if anything, it, the cover was somewhat more than it started about a decade earlier. So clearly, this is a reef location on Morea on the fore reef that's very highly resistant. We had resilient. We had hardly um, any coral left in 2010, and only about five years later, we've got a, a very large assemblage of, of coral that's covering the fore reef there. Now, uh, not all locations on the fore reef of Morea are as resilient as this one, and we're beginning to understand why that's so. But the main features that explain why this location on the fore reef is so resistant fall into two uh, reasons or mechanisms. One is that right after those disturbances removed all the live coral on the fore reef, we had a tremendous population explosion of herbivorous fishes, um, especially parrotfish. And these things graze very intensively on the reef bottom, scraping up small algae. And they suppress the growth of seaweeds that could potentially have dominated on the reef. And so by suppressing the seaweed growth, they kept the substrate open so that young coral could uh, recolonize on the reef. Now, these parrotfish were able to respond this way as a, a population dynamic response because they're not overfished and they have inshore nursery habitats <clears throat> very close to shore in the lagoons, and those habitats were not affected very much by the cyclone and by the crown of thorns outbreak. Now, the second reason for resilience of the four reef is that in the years following the disturbance, we had a gigantic recolonization of young corals. And this is an example of one that's about, uh, about uh, a couple centimeters wide, and that is about nine months old. And so it's that recolonization of young reproductive propagules of coral that was able to come onto the substrate on the fore reef that was being kept clean and ready for colonization by the herbivorous fish that enabled this um, huge and rapid recovery uh, on the fore reef site. Now, corals could recolonize in part because there were nearby sources of adult corals, because to have these young reproductive colonists arriving, you need adults, right, that are reproducing and uh, providing those. And we know that there were adult corals available for reproduction. And they, this requires also physical oceanographic connectivity between source populations, some of which were probably in the lagoons of Morea, some of which were other islands, um, and the four reef location where those young uh, colonists arrived and settled. Now, um, I'll just quickly 
tell you a little bit about what we know about the lagoons. Our evidence so far is that the lagoon reefs are a lot less affected by some of our big natural disturbances, like cyclones, for example, and crown of thorns sea stars, but they are much more vulnerable to human impact because they're closer to the shore. And we're currently actively exploring causes of lower ecological resilience of the lagoons. And again, here's just a couple of time series from a few sites in the lagoon, about a decade uh, long uh, w worth of data here. And you can see the sites on the left were coral dominated in 2006, and they've pretty much maintained uh, a good cover of coral through the last decade or so. On the right, you see a different pattern, which are other sites that lost their coral cover and are beginning to be dominated by these really large uh, fleshy algae that you can see growing on the reef in place of the coral. And we want to know why this is so. Uh, why are some sites in the lagoon losing coral, and when they lose it, not regaining it? Why are other sites retaining their coral cover or even increasing in coral cover? So we know, uh, because we've been studying it um, a lot, is that there is fishing pressure on some of these key herbivorous fish in the lagoons. Not so much on the fore reef, but very close to shore, there is in some parts of the island pretty intense fishing pressure. And that pressure is extremely high on a couple of key species like this one here that eat the large algae. And so if you do get large algae growing, there's a few species that will consume that and take it off the reef. Um, but unfortunately, those are key, heavily targeted fishes in the, in the local fishery of Morea. And then in addition, land use pro practices obviously can contribute to nutrient and sediment inputs and uh, pesticide inputs, all kinds of stuff like that can come into the lagoons and affect the health of corals. Now, one problem that we have in thinking about uh, resilience in the lagoon is that unlike the fore reef, which is a relatively um, consistent and unvarying landscape, the lagoons have tremendously high levels of spatial variation over really small scales. And so you could see here just a little piece of um, one of the corners of the island, and you can see all of the different habitat complexity within the lagoon. You've got small islands or called motus in there. You have deeper blue water channels, um, different patches of live and dead coral, and so on and so forth. And this makes it much harder for us to understand uh, the processes that, that weaken or strengthen resilience in the lagoon. And here are just some photos um, uh, that just illustrate how uh, physically variable the habitat structure in the lagoon is. You can see that there's areas of sand, there's small patch reefs, um, there's large and small structures, some of which extend through the water column almost to the surface, and so on and so forth. And that habitat structure is variable on really short spatial scales. So we have a real challenge in assessing, quantifying, mapping, and modeling um, the, those, the physical habitat structure. And Jim can certainly tell you a lot about how water moves around these complex structures, which then again affects all kinds of biological processes, including the, the delivery and settlement of corals. Now, we know from a pretty recent data set that we just really had got a couple months ago, the analyses, these are probably the first really comprehensive um, data about nutrient loading on the island of Morea. And we established about a year ago about 180 sites in the lagoons. And you can see some of the dots there. Um, we've got sites around the entire island. And at those sites, we make a variety of different measurements, one of which is um, um, uh, a collection of macroalgae that, that lets us look at time-average nutrient loading. 
And I won't go through the details here, but of course the colors tell you something about the level of nutrient loading, red being high, obviously, and that magenta color and blue and stuff being low. And you can see that the nutrient hotspots largely correspond to bays and water drainages. Um, and we have some information from stable isotopes that indicate that, that at least some of that nutrient loading is anthropogenic in origin. And so we're in the process of now looking at issues like seasonal variation in nutrient loading. This is just one snapshot um, in time. But we have the samples now that are going to let us look at a, more of a time series and address seasonal aspects of nutrient loading. And clearly, a lot of nutrients in the lagoon fosters the growth of algae, which can be very harmful to coral, right? Because algae can overgrow coral, or they can take the place of cor coral really quickly on the reef if they're not consumed by herbivores. And that, that process is sped up if they are fed nutrients uh, in these hot spots. Now, in addition, as I mentioned, fishing pressure is a lot higher in the lagoons compared to the fore reef. And we also now know that it varies greatly around the island. And so one explanation of variation and resilience then clearly could relate to spatial variation in nutrient loading and spatial variation in fishing on some of the key herbivorous fishes in the system. So this... Uh, this situation, especially with respect to the lagoon, really uh, indicates that we need whole island simulation models that can let us look at not just the human activities, the physical environment, and the biological environment to begin to understand all the linkages and the feedbacks in the system. And of course, the first step, which we, uh, a number of us here in the room and others, obviously, um, is to, be, to build and verify some component models. And these, of course, depend on long-term measurements and short-term process studies and experiments that people do, um, field and mesocosm experiments, some of which can uh, last for years, actually, and then um, modeling and integration. Uh, of, of a, a lot of different aspects of the system. And so as Neil has said, the ultimate aim that we have for the avatar is to be able to do scenario modeling for the whole island, not just the biological system, but for the social ecological system, and um, really begin to explore the effects of things like climate change, human population growth, changes in economic activity, and so on and so forth uh, going forward in, uh, for the island. And also to scenario model to, to help us develop strategies for maintaining resilience of the Morea ecosystem. And I will end there. Uh, you showed that there's a recovery of, you showed a picture of 50% for cover mm -hmm. and 55% for mm -hmm. rebound there. I was wondering if any of your data about coral cover changes goes down the community composition level? So yes. Um, I, I didn't have time to talk about that. But um, there, there are two aspects of recovery, obviously. Um, I just showed you data on percent cover of live coral. And actually, it's one thing to think about a lot if you look at literature on disturbance and recovery in coral reefs because... Most studies just really think about percent cover of coral. And that's super different from taxonomic composition of coral and also size, colony size in this case, because corals are colonies, the size structure of the coral. Because as the foundation species, uh, bigger corals are often more valuable in habitat support for fishes and invertebrates, for example, than really small individuals of the same species. So we have a lot of data about that. And if you look at the rate of recovery of live coral cover of our sites around the island, those rates of recovery after those disturbances vary, okay? And if you look at the community reassembly, and um, the trajectory for that, those rates vary, and they're strongly correlated 
to the rate of recovery of live coral cover. So we know that, for example, on the North Shore, the community of corals and of macroalgae, because there's a little bit of that out there, and fishes are reassembling to what they were in 2005. There, I have not, we don't have all the 2016 data, which is the most recent yet, but um, by 2015, a couple of the North Shore sites were pretty close to reassembling to their starting taxonomic composition. Doesn't mean the sizes of the corals are, were like they were in 2005, but there's been strong reassembly. The fish are coming more slowly because they, a lot of them depend on the corals. So they lag in their, re, their taxonomic reassembly, the corals, but they are also tracking back to their starting, um, their starting taxonomic composition. So yeah, there's a few different aspects there, and it's really important to not just look at percent cover of live coral, which is a good metric, but it's, as you know, it doesn't tell the whole story. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Zoe. So we do have to step out for calls, so, but uh, George is up next to finish uh, this session, and then we go to a break at 10.30 for coffee. So, thanks for so thank you, and thank you, Mateus. Uh, thank you, Microsoft, for coming to meet Maria. Uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, terrestrial uh, components of the system, and as we'll discuss more, um, the terrestrial uh, features are tightly connected to the uh, aquatic features, um, both in terms of nutrients and uh, sediment and things like that, but there's also flows from the aquatic system into the terrestrial system, uh, also in terms of nutrients and uh, energy flow. Um, I'm going to discuss invasive insects uh, today, which is just one component of this avatar project, and, and one that I think um, shows the connections between the, the biophysical uh, aspects of the community that we're studying, and then also the, the social economic uh, features of, of island ecosystems. Um, global systems are connected. Uh, this map on the top there shows uh, how we are connected, and of course, this is of no surprise. One of the consequences of these connections is that uh, the, the world's biota uh, is becoming homogenized. We are finding things all over the world that were not there before, uh, sometimes with um, uh, very large implications for uh, um, native ecosystems, but also managed ecosystems um, like urban ones ourselves. Um, Tatiroa and Marea are certainly connected through shipping. Um, and other uh, sorts of connections, as, as was mentioned earlier, we have a fiber optic network, so we're also connected in terms of uh, data and, and information. Um, Neil mentioned in, in the first talk that we had a, a large uh, biocode project that was an all taxon survey, terrestrial and, and marine, that was funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Uh, you heard about some of the, the marine parts earlier. Uh, the terrestrial uh, component uh, surveyed all the available habitats uh, plants, insects, um, uh, fungi, all the micro, macro biota that we could find. Uh, we're now moving into the um, microbiome um, with this, this avatar project. But just sort of as an example, um, here are uh, Lepidoptera, butterflies and, and uh, moths uh, found on the island. Uh, the red are the invasive ones. We tend to have a, a lot of observations of um, single species that are quite widespread. Blue are uh, the native ones. And we can do various kinds of uh, manipulations with the relatedness between taxa to figure out whether uh, unknown species are invasive or native. The native species tend to show more genetic variation between uh, individuals and populations. And the invasive species tend to all look the same um, genetically, because they tend to be all the same uh, colonization event. And there's some things we can do with machine learning to actually um, uh, perfect an approach to identify things uh, just based on their DNA, even if uh, we don't know what they are um, from um, genetic databases. Another uh, set of invasive species in uh, Morea, but also Tetiroa, are the mosquitoes. And here are two, Aedes aegypti, which is uh, commonly found in, in urban settings, and Aedes polynesiensis. Uh, which is in many different kinds of habitats um, in French Polynesia. And these are well known as vectors of human diseases, especially dengue, 
uh, Zika, which I'll talk, dengue, sorry, Zika, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, and some others. And this is work that is led by Hervé Balsan, who is uh, at ILM, uh, which is a French Polynesian health uh, ministry uh, in French Polynesia. And this, uh, this team is, uh, is uh, actually amazingly good. In fact, they uh, used um, DNA samples um, early in the Zika outbreak, which I'll talk to you about in a minute, uh, to actually document that Zika was present. Um, and they, they had a very well-known paper uh, on this topic. Anyway, so um, uh, this project that I'm going to talk about is, is part of the avatar uh, led by Hervé, and it makes use of the fact that islands are uh, some mostly con closed, uh, controlled ecosystems um, that we can do manipulations uh, very easily on site. Here's just a diagram of the Zika outbreak that uh, came through French Polynesia in 2013, and you can see there the map shows that in the 40s and 50s, actually Zika was in Africa. Uh, and then it spread through uh, India and then through Southeast Asia into the Pacific, um, reaching French Polynesia in 2013, and then subsequently to South America and, and elsewhere. What was really fascinating is that um, in French Polynesia, because Zika is, not, um, is, not, is often not detected if you have it, it's somewhat mild, um, um, many people were probably infected, but didn't know about it. And retrospective studies looking at um, people's DNA suggest that probably 2 thirds of the people, uh, at least in Tahiti, probably were uh, infected. And it was a small enough, a small enough number so that these other associated effects uh, that we've heard about, birth defects, um, uh, were not detected. Although uh, at this time, retrospectively, uh, these, these um, uh, incidences of these birth defects did occur as well. Okay, um, we have, or we, the, the world has now technologies uh, to deal with invasive species. And for example, we can manipulate them genetically. We can put genes in there so that uh, they will eventually kill themselves um, by themselves. Um, and these technologies are readily available. Uh, the, the challenges now are really social and cultural challenges. Do we want this to take place? Are we comfortable? removing an entire species, such as a mosquito species that might uh, spread diseases like Zika, but also uh, malaria and so on. Uh, in, in French Polynesia, um, 80s mosquitoes uh, shown here uh, have a certain bacterium in them called Wolbachia. And all mosquitoes have this bacterium. And this uh, bacterium comes in different forms. And this creates um, uh, sets of incompatibilities between different populations. So what the researchers did um, in uh, French Polynesia is to uh, rear some of the mosquitoes with uh, one of these forms and rear mos other mosquitoes with the other form of this bacteria. And then to look at uh, populations, especially Tatiroa, figure out what uh, form of the Wolbachia were present, and then introduce males um, of the other form. And, um, the consequence of this leads to uh, the suppression of uh, populations locally. And uh, islands such as uh, Morea and uh, Tahiti and Tetiroa are wonderful uh, locations for this kind of study, just because we can control somewhat uh, what is coming in and, and what is coming out. OK, so what they did then is to uh, rear up um, individuals uh, it, with one kind of this bacterium um, in Tahiti in great numbers. Uh, they, they figured out a way to uh, separate the males and females based on size. So the idea is that they would re release a lot of uh, males uh, with a certain uh, bacterium. They would mate with the native females, and the offspring would be sterile. So they had to transport them, and they, they're doing this regularly, transporting them from Tahiti to Tetiaroa. And they chose uh, two islands, at least initially, uh, as their study uh, islands. They chose as the treatment um, the, the island with a hotel on it, uh, because that's where uh, people want to get rid of uh, mosquitoes most rapidly. And then the control, another uh, uh, island that's uh, farther out. Um, and there are uh, possibilities to do other sorts of manipulations on these other islands as well. So here are the results just uh, preliminarily. 
um, from um, the past year and a half. And I should say that um, you know, this is a, a single treatment and a single control. And so it, it should be replicated, but at least the results are quite promising. So shown here in orange, and these are different scales, but shown here in orange are the, is the treatment, and this is numbers of mosquitoes that they monitored um, after starting this release program. Uh, orange uh, decreased near the hotel. The control island um, sputtered around and is now uh, certainly the same or, or increasing, suggesting that this approach uh, is promising. And again, this is an approach that that isn't really genetic engineering because we're not really manipulating the genes, but in a sense, it's certainly manipulating the genetics um, by swapping in or changing the bacteria that are associated uh, with, these, with these mosquitoes. As a result of, um, or following on this result, um, we had in 2016 now, um, a uh, large workshop of, of mosquito experts who came and, uh, to French Polynesia and um, studied this uh, system in some detail and um, made a plan for future studies uh, that could use this same ecosystem for uh, other studies like it. Uh, and this included uh, groups that were interested in data science and physically mod uh, modeling the habitats, things like the, the flow of water, the flow of wind, um, the connections between these different habitats. Um, people who are interested in um, the biodiversity of these ecosystems, microbiome, um, and how these uh, different populations are connected, uh, the social ecological systems, uh, the extent to which uh, these organisms have been associated with pe people uh, in the past, perhaps as early as the earliest uh, Polynesians, and then finally, a section where uh, we're doing simulations to look at uh, how we might use this approach and uh, other approaches um, involving genes and Wolbachia of mosquitoes to uh, rid perhaps Tahiti of, of these same uh, kinds of mosquitoes. Um, and we like this uh, um, aspect of, the, of this Morea avatar project because it really does uh, tie nicely um, things that are happening in um, uh, natural ecosystems with what's happening to uh, people and, and their livelihoods. Um, and one uh, possibility a as a hypothesis is that, in fact, when um, people are um, uh, concerned about their own health and are dealing with an outbreak like, like Zika and are making decisions about their own livelihoods, uh, that their finances might be affected and they might be looking to um, uh, increase their um, income or make things uh, more easy for themselves, which may have an impact also on fishing uh, and uh, connections um, in the reef. And this is a hypothesis that we're, we're investigating as a, as a team and, and looking at. Uh, for example, when, when uh, there are issues about human health, uh, how does this affect the ecosystems, not only in terrestrial systems where you know, we're trying to get rid of mosquitoes, but, but also um, in reef e ecosystems through the direct and indirect effects of uh, people's choices uh, related to health and their, and their livelihoods. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, the mosquito work is continuing. Um, there are uh, several groups around the world that are that are uh, genetically manipulating mosquitoes, and Hervé and others have are, are involved in um, um, at least the preliminary discussions of using uh, islands like this as test cases for uh, some of the early releases of these uh, sorts of genetically modified organisms, uh, just because they can be um, these these islands can be uh, closed uh, to a greater extent than, for example, a continental system uh, where they're also of people infected by these diseases. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Which organisms feed on the mosquitoes and have their populations declined? So which organisms feed on the mosquitoes? So that's really interesting. And um, these are mosquitoes, as you know, are uh, uh, aquatic as uh, larvae. And the adults um, probably are quite important for uh, predators like spiders. Um, but also birds. Uh, one of the interesting things here is that there are multi mos multiple mosquito species, and so it's quite likely that getting rid of um, uh, 
one mosquito probably doesn't solve the whole problem, but, but that's a very interesting uh, question. And you know, that always comes up when, when the public, people are in the, the public is faced with, well, what if we get rid of mosquitoes? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, you know, malaria is bad, but what role do these mosquitoes play in the ecosystems? I mean, in this sort of system, you know, as an ecologist, you know, I'm, I'm quite willing to bet that their role would be filled by other things in the communities, other mosquitoes, but also other flies uh, and well, other things. How long has it been in Tatira? Well, you know, that's uh, interesting. Um, so there, there are at least, well, I think there are four or five um, on Morea, and probably they're all on, on, on Tetiroa at, at different times. Um, uh, it's quite likely that it, it, Aedes aegypti came um, relatively recently, maybe with the Europeans, um, Polynesiensis, uh, possibly with the Polynesians. Neil studied this and thought about this. Uh, well, so. is European recent introduction. So, yeah. so the bar is relatively low in these systems where the thing we're trying to get rid of was introduced by humans fairly recently anyway. So, you know, it may have become an important part of the ecosystem since, but you're at least uh, restoring it to, it wasn't there naturally. Humans put it in there in the first place. So the, so the risk is relatively low in the sense that, that we, were, we were the ones who put them there. Which is not true, of course, in other parts of the world where they're, they're native, the kind of long, long parts of that system. And so many other things might now be linked and depending on them. But this is an interesting debate that's, that's you know, larger than this island and uh, this system. Um, you know, even should we be manipulating uh, organisms that cause great harm? And, uh, you know, important people have spoken out on both sides of this, of this argument. Um, but here's a way that we can actually, you know, look at these systems. We can um, ask your question uh, very specifically. What happens uh, to these communities over time as you um, make these changes? In fact, one really interesting thing um, has to do with connections to rats, for example. So um, rats are quite important on these islands, and they, um, uh, they gnaw open coconuts, which provide a, a, a place for water to, to uh, uh, accumulate and the mosquitoes grow. Uh, and so just manipulating rats, for example, has a big impact on, on the mosquitoes. And the mosquitoes, in turn, um, are transmitting diseases that uh, no doubt affect the small mammals and the birds and the lizards. And so all of these things are tightly tied uh, together. So, you know, it's, it's islands like this where you could um, uh, look at that complex of interactions and say, okay, we can manipulate this, we can get rid of one species, what happens to the rest? And Neil's trying to write a, a, a fairly large <laughs> grant to NSF uh, just on that topic um, with several people who can contribute those different um, Perspectives. So, so the, the rats are obviously introduced too. So on, on, on Tetiara, how much of the flora and fauna is native and how much of it is introduced? Well, probably yeah, others are better. At, you know, a lot of the lowland um, flora uh, in, in Polynesia is, is widespread and found throughout uh, the Pacific. And so, um, you know, some of that certainly is, is native or indigenous. Um, but uh, likely not endemic. In fact, in the low areas, there are very few endemic species um, compared to the, the higher elevations. And it's been, um, the flora has been moved around since uh, people were there and, and probably even before, you know, coconuts and organisms that disperse easily uh, come and go. So I would say it's probably, I mean, there, there could be a lot of indigenous things that are widespread in the Pacific, but uh, not a lot of things that are Introduction. Yes, and then there are many things that came uh, more recently, especially you know through horticulture. Any comments about that? Uh, lots, but probably yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lots of, of later discussions. So when people have looked at, at introdu introductions of plants, for example, they find that there are um, many more introduced, many more species of plants now than there likely were before. Uh, humans arrived, and a part of that is, of course, um, uh, introductions for agriculture, but also, you know, landscaping um, species and, and so on. And that's not the case for birds. You know, we know something about the, um, what was there before humans from these uh, sort of fossilized or pre-fossil 
bones in caves. And it looks like, um, you know, the, the numbers of birds have not uh, increased dramatically with all the more recent introductions of different bird species. Anyway, so in, in, uh, for plants anyway, they're, you know, the botanists or the horticulturalists would, would argue that we're adding a lot more niches. We're really increasing the biodiversity uh, greatly in these, especially urban systems. Are we good? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. I'll let you do that. Are there are more questions from anyone? If not, we break and uh, to, uh, to continue. You, uh, I think, at 11 with the session on Teteroa. Unfortunately, there.